the Professor Magidic, uh, this Slavko. Um, interesting topic because there's not so much new in STEMI. We have relatively new recommendations from the guidelines and nothing has changed. But I will tell you what will change uh, most obviously within the next one or two years. You may know that the next guidelines are combined ECS guidelines, STEMI and non-STEMI together. And uh, I hope that some of the things I will present you will be part of these guidelines. So here are my conflicts of interest. Okay, wrong direction. So this is what I want to talk to you. You may know that in non-STEMI, and you will hear about this, I guess, that Prasenbrill uh, should be used um, instead or uh, better than Ticacryl or in the cat lab. In non-STEMI it was quite clear. Meanwhile, we have also data for STEMI. I will talk a bit about the personalized dual antiplatelet strategy after STEMI because here is a lot of change. And uh, finally, about lipid lowering. So strike early and strong is something uh, our association uh, is longing for. And we just have written uh, a position paper, and we come to this a bit later, with uh, some new ideas here. So what about Brasogrill versus Ticacrylor? So this is the ISREACT 5 study schedule. On the right-hand side, non stemi unstable in China. It's not the topic for me. On the left-hand side, STEMI. And exactly as the guidelines tell us, patients with STEMI were uh, pre-treated with Ticacrylor or Brasogrill in the respective loading dosages. And then they received an angiogram, an intervention, and a Ticacryl or Prasugrel were followed in these patients. So what are the data? And very similar to the non-STEMI situation, on the left-hand side you can see the primary endpoint, the compo composite of the FMI stroke. There was a reduction for Prasugrel compared to Ticacryl. This was not statistically significant, but the trend is very similar. On the right hand side, you see there's also a trend for less bleeding complications, also not statistical uh, uh, different. But you will see whether this will come into the next guidelines because it's not so different from non STEMI patients. So they also did a landmark analysis, and also here there's a trend um, in favor of Prasugrel left hand side with respect to the primary endpoint. Now, can we explain this? And I think we can, meanwhile, because we have several data <coughs> from basic research. On the left-hand side, you can see patients who received Prasugrel or Ticacrylor within 24 hours, or between 24 and 48 hours. You can see that patients on Prasugrel in blue uh, have a lower um, ADP-induced platelet aggregation compared to patients on Ticacrylor. And the higher platelet aggregation, you can see this on the right hand side, the, uh, the more uh, ischemic events occur. So this is for both groups on the right hand side. And I think it's, uh, this is important, and eventually this may explain that Prasugrel has uh, at least a tendency for better outcome data. What about personalized or antiplatelet strategy after STEMI? So this is a non-STEMI scheme, but STEMI is exactly the same. Uh, and um, what I would like to show you is first um, a prolongation of dual antiplatelet therapy. So which patients should have a prolonged therapy? Uh, and this goes up to three years here. So which are the patients? And the, the data exclusively come from this trial, Pegasus 254 we have two different dosages of Ticacrylor twice daily, either 90 or 60 milligram, <coughs> were better than aspirin alone. So we know that. So what were the patients we should include? And when we asked our colleagues several years ago, uh, most tell, tell us my, it's between 15 and 30 percent that my patients need a prolonged dual antiplatelet strategy. So this, I think, is really not the case, and I come to this in a minute. So what were the high risk features for uh, an increased ischemic risk? It was the history of STEMI, prior stent thrombosis, stenting of the last remaining patent coronary artery, diffuse multivessel disease, especially in diabetics, chronic kidney disease. 
And then we had also high risk features for procedural risk. And you see this below, and this comes from uh, a publication from Neumann. Three vessels treated more than three lesions at, at, the, at one uh, uh, intervention treated. Total stand, stand length more than 60 millimeters. Bifurcation with two stands. Any atherectomy device left main as target. Surgical bypass cleft, chronic total occlusion. And one, only one of these variables usually was necessary to uh, think that the patient is a, in a very high risk. So is this really true? Now, this is an interesting publication. It's not published at the moment. It will be published within the next few issues of the European Heart Journal. It's the same group that did the Pegasus trial, Bonacca. It's a long-term uh, investigation of the Pegasus patients um, about, as can you, uh, you can see here, uh, patients had only about 20% a high bleeding risk. So they were not, had no prolonged uh, total antiplatelet strategy. The others had a, long, a prolonged strategy as their bleeding risk was normal or low. And only if they had more than three ischemic risk factors at the same time, there was a significant benefit for prolongation of total antiplatelet therapy. So what were the um, variables here, the ischemic risk factors? Here you can see a recent MI within two years, for example, multivessel disease, diabetes, peripheral artery disease, chronic kidney disease, multiple prior MIs. So this is part of what we, I have shown you before, but only if you have three factors, you really need a prolongation of the antiplatelet strategy. So we know these high bleeding risk variables, and I think that the, that the BARC uh, score is uh, uh, the most important at the moment. And you can see on the left hand side, I don't go into detail, the major variables that uh, lead to an increased bleeding risk. And on the uh, right side, it's the minor variables. You need one major or at least two minor to have an increased bleeding risk. And now, what do the guidelines tell us? If you have an increased bleeding risk, could be very high or high, then you should, should shorten the antiplatelet strategy for one up to three months, followed by, followed by monotherapy with elasprin alone or clopidogrel. And what are the trials that uh, investigated it? It's smart choice for the high bleeding risk, and I would like to focus on the very high bleeding risk. Stop Army 2 showed us this is a great idea. Only one month of total antiplatelet strategy has been clopidogrel, followed by clopidogrel as monotherapy. But stop army 2 was only performed in ACS patients where we know that the ischemic risk is higher. What is the outcome? An increase in myocardial infarction if you only have a monotherapy with clopidogrel after short total antiplatelet strategy. So this doesn't give us uh, a clear idea what to do with these patients, but I think we should look at the patient on an individual basis and decide whether the right strategy would be only one month of tools and a brittle strategy, eventually to use a stronger P2I driven type of inhibitorized monotherapy. We have no clear data, but what is clear is there is more ischemic events on the right hand side. You see the major secondary bleeding endpoint, which is significantly lower as expected, but here we might have a problem. And the most interesting thing is uh, if you have a normal or low bleeding risk, that you can reduce dual antiplatelet strategy from the original 12 months to one to three months. And interventional cardiolo cardiologists don't believe this usually, but we have very good data. And these are the three trials where dual antiplatelet uh, 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 therapy was shortened one to three months just by skipping aspirin, and then go on with a P2I12 inhibitor as monotherapy. It's global leaders, it's twilight and tico, and I only give you one example, which is the twilight study, because I think this is the study that was um, uh, performed best, had, has a great design, and they do three months of dual antiplatelet surgery, then following with tico as monotherapy. And this is the outcome data. Significant less bleeding complications on the left hand side and no sign for more ischemic events on the right hand side. So do we believe this? So is this really uh, a group of patients that includes 
high-risk patients, complicated on anatomy. Uh, yes, I think it is, because these are all the further sub-studies that have been performed. And they're also exactly the same uh, an outcome comparable to the main trial with a significant reduced bleeding event and similar mass rates. And I give you one example, because this is exactly the patients we are discussing over time. Twilight complex. So this is patients with a complex anatomy, exactly what I have given you before. But also here, only one of these variables was necessary, and we have no idea how it is if you have two or three, and what the real outcome will be. But it's exactly what I have shown you, and the outcome data are exactly the same. Left-hand side, bleeding complications. The dotted lines are patients uh, who had a shorter dual antiplatelet strategy, followed by ticagulose monotherapy, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the other lines above. These are patients who have a 12 months to a platelet strategy. And the interesting thing is there's no difference between complex and non-complex um, patients. On the right hand side, mass rate, no difference. So this seems to work. I'm not quite sure how it is with patients who have more than one ischemic risk factor. We need to look at this in the future. <clears throat> so the take home message here is, a shortened duration of ductal bleeding complications without increasing ischemic mass rates, also in ECS patients with high risk for ischemic events, and also in patients with complex lesions. Consider one up to three months of duct followed by a single antiplatelet uh, therapy in patients with lower normal bleeding risk. Main question, this is good for the planned surgery, but what about elderly patients who usually have a higher bleeding risk? Would this be a good idea for a patient, let's say, older than 70 or 80 uh, years of age? And we see more patients uh, in this age class. And consider only one month of doubt followed by p 2 drug inhibitors in high bleeding risk patients. Where it is clear, but the main question is, is clopidogrel a good drug as monotherapy afterwards? My personal uh, uh, believing is that p 2 drug inhibitor monotherapy after short duct might be a future indication in a majority of patients with normal bleeding risk. And this is what the recent American guidelines tell us. They have this one to three months of p 12 inhibitor monotherapy already in their guidelines for ACS and also for stable patients. So this is something we don't have at the moment in the European guidelines, but I'm quite sure uh, it will come. And this was uh, uh, an editorial I was asked to write with respect to which patients should have a, sh uh, uh, a shortened dual antiplatelet strategy. And for me, it's elderly patients, mainly elderly patients, and for sure patients with an increased bleeding risk or patients who need surgery. And you have two options. What I showed you is to shorten dual antiplatelet strategy followed by uh, the p 2 12 inhibitor as monotherapy. But you could also uh, run a so-called de-escalation strategy. The patient is on prasugrel or ticagrelo in combination with aspirin first. And after one to three months, you switch to clopidogrel as uh, um, um, a substance uh, with less efficacy but less bleeding complications. So I, I didn't want to go into detail here, but this is an option for the future. Last uh, topic, lipid lowering strike early and strong. So we know that are patients with a very high risk um, for ischemic events, and I have these patients here again. This is the acute coronary syndrome patient. It's a patient with, famili with a famili uh, familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, patients with severe kidney disease, diabetes, and the target organ damage as examples. So we have a lot of these patients, and these patients need an optimal lipid lowering. And what is the, uh, the goal? The goal in these patients is to go below 55 milligram per deciliter uh, cholesterol, or at least um, uh, reduce the initial um, uh, LDL cholesterol to 50% or more. So this is the paper I told you about. It's in a, a position paper in collaboration with the European Association of Preventive Cardiology and the group on cardiovascular pharmacotherapy. It's not published at the moment, but it's accepted. And what is the idea behind? So now this is a patient with a high risk for ischemic events, and a lowering of LDL cholesterol, cholesterol is extremely important. 
So the trouble is chemical complications. After an ACS, usually are highest within the first month, up to three months. So this for me means we should be very quick with, with lowering LDL cholesterol. That's one point. The guidelines tell us, still tell us, you start with a, a high effective statin, then you add a cetimab, and then you add a, P, a PCSK9 inhibitor, for example. So this, this lasts about three months until you have an optimal uh, LDL reduction. But within these three months, you have the highest rate of ischemic events. So why not do it differently? And the other thing is that an extended LDLC reduction leads to plug stabilization. So we have data for that. So we have no clear outcome data at the moment, but it brings if you do it very quick, very fast, uh, and very strong. But I will uh, show you just some ideas. So what, what agents do we have to reduce uh, LDL cholesterol? We have a moderately active statin that should not be used. We should only use atorvastatin, rosuvastatin, the strong lipid-lowering uh, statins. And you get 50% of reduction. If you add a cetimab, you are on 65%. If you add a PCSK9 inhibitor to statin and a cetimab, 85%. So if you just know your, the LDL, the basic LDL situation, when a patient comes in, you can calculate whether it will be possible to bring these patients in short time um, below the, the cutoff of 55. The PCSK9 inhibition alone as monotherapy is not done 50%. The new drug, pempetoic acid, 20 to 25%. Makes only sense if a patient has an LDL cholesterol of 65 or 70 to use pempetoic acid to get the patient below the 55% and also the combination of statin and pempetoic acid shown here. And the other thing is, do we have any data that a fast reduction of LDL cholesterol leads to less, to less ischemic events? We have two small trials with statins. And these trials show you if, you, uh, if the time between randomization and intervention in an ACS patient is less than five hours, you have a lower odds ratio with respect to ischemic events. And the same in the second trial. Up to two hours before PCI, if you, do, if you give a turbostat without looking at LDL levels, you have a better outcome in this patient. So there is something with LDLC reduction that is important if you do it quickly. And this is for statins. And there's one trial now going on with a PCSK9 inhibitor, Amundsen, uh, and this trial is done with Evolucoma. Now, Evolucoma is also uh, quite interesting because this is a drug that reduces LDL cholesterol uh, within four days. You can see it on the left hand side. After four to seven days, this is the hospital stay of the patient. If you start day one, then you have a reduction of 60%. No other drug can do it. Eventually also uh, the, the second PCSK9 inhibitor uh, that is uh, available but it's not in Clisiran, it's not a statin. They all lead at least two to three weeks until they get an optimal LDL reduction. So this is something I think we should be um, uh, in, our, in, our, in, in our brain and we should eventually use these drugs in the future. It's not allowed at the moment to start with the PCSK9 inhibitor, but it could be a great idea if this is possible. And now some words about plug stabilization. From former trials with statins, we know the lower LDL cholesterol, the better the outcome was with respect to the, to, to the uh, plug that was initially seen. Some examples in the upper part, you can see ACS patients, uh, and when they are treated, baseline 50% of plug volume, 44% after follow-up, or 53 to 50%. So even with statins, plugs, were reduced, the plug volume was reduced, plugs became more fibrotic, more stable. Now we have data for the two PCSK9 inhibitors, the Huygens trial with Evolocumab. It shows you a stronger LDL reduction, and this is on the left hand side compared to placebo, but it shows you a massive increase of the fibrous cap thickness, which also stabilizes the drug. And we have data from the Pacman trial with Alirocuma, the other PCSK9 inhibitor, that shows you uh, um, on the left-hand side 
the reduction of the plug mass from 62 to 50 percent. There is also some kind of a calcification in this plug. Um, the middle part shows you the near infrared spectroscopy, which, give, which gives you um, an idea how how much lipid is in a plug. And you can see it's massively reduced, and usually lipid is associated also with uh, with inflammation. And on the right hand side, it's not so good to see. You have also an increase uh, in the thickness of the of the fibrous cap. So this is interesting. The only problem is all these investigations were done 12 months after the start of therapy. So we don't know how fast this works, but we believe that it must be earlier than 12 months uh, in order to stabilize uh, the patient. Now this is what we are doing now, and this, this is not for your use, but I tell you what we are doing now in my hospital. So we have here the treatment goals at less than 55 or more than 50% reduction in a patient with, a, with repeated ACS, <coughs> eventually lower than 40%. And, and what we are doing, we, we don't look at the LDL cholesterol. The patient comes in to the emergency department with an ACS, and he receives immediately, immediately uh, a high dose study in combination with acetamide. Because this is possible in my country mm -hmm. to start with this combination therapy, and we have tablets where both substances are in. We do it in any case, and then we look during the hospital stay what the basal LDL cholesterol is. And only if it is more than 130 in a patient who is not pretreated, we ask the patient to come back to our own specific lipid outpatient service to, to have the opportunity to, to, to add a PCS canine inhibitor within four weeks. So after four weeks, four to six weeks, the patients come in. If the patients are pre-treated, it's a bit different. You have to look which drugs can be optimized to start in. Uh, uh, do we have to add an acetamab first? Because this is what we can do based on what is allowed in my country. But also these patients come back and then we try within, the, within one month to add a PCS canine inhibitor to have an optimal result. So this is what I think is new or will be new within the next guidelines. Thank you very much.